and there's been an extraordinary reaction to the news that we broke on this show yesterday that Nicola Sturgeon was to step down in a dramatic surprise move uh, as First Minister of Scotland. Um, I know Nicola Sturgeon well. I used to know her very well. Uh, Alex Salmond, of course, used to be uh, her mentor, a man who created her in a way as a politician, uh, a man who was sensible enough to have her as his number two, so that when he left uh, as leader of the SNP in 2014 following the referendum on independence, he had somebody he could hand power over to. She has not done that. She has nobody to hand power to. And the SNP now finds itself, I think, in a bit of a vacuum. But let's talk to uh, Alex Salmond, former First Minister of Scotland himself, former leader of the SNP, now leader of the Albert Party. Alex, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I mean, enough time has now passed. I mean, I know you've been talking a lot about this story because obviously you're right at the heart of it, right at the centre of it, but, but I wanted to ask you more about sort of personally how you feel about this because your relationship with Nicola Sturgeon has been uh, all over the place. It's been from, it gone from mentor to friend to enemy to I don't know what it is now, but, but you know, she's a remarkable woman in many ways, but I find it incredible that she, as clever as we know that she is, has made so many blunders in recent years that we've led her she's led herself to this point yeah i mean i, I never like seeing people resign so i felt for nicola yesterday i mean I, i've been there mike yes <laughs> it's not an easy process but, you, but you're right to to say that uh, the difference between now and 2014 when i resigned is that nicola was a shoo in uh, to become uh, first minister in 2014 and now the the field for the SNP and First Minister is wide open. Uh, I mean, there's old guard and there's new guard. Uh, my guess would be they might opt for the new guard on the basis of the, the old guard were, were up to snuff, then they wouldn't have been overshadowed by Nicola Sturgeon. But anyway, the field is wide open because uh, and Nicola, you know, she had many, many talents. Communication, obviously, during the COVID epidemic, much better than it was down here. But she's, while on independence, left the SNP without a strategy uh, as well as without a leader. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you were to be harsh on her, you would say that she's achieved literally nothing in the field of independence. You know, the referendum result uh, in 2014 would be replicated, we are, we are led to believe, by the polls, if you look at them now. No more people want independence now than did then. And after eight years, you, you'd call that uh, a pretty hopeless result, wouldn't you? Well, certainly, I mean, you know, Nicola's strength as a communicator, you would have thought would have had more effect on persuading people on independence. I mean, you know, if, you, if you can take a country through COVID, you might think you would uh, you'd be able to succeed on, on independence. I mean, and Nicola's won elections. I mean, that's quite important for a politician. Yes. I mean, you know, if you win elections, you can't do anything. But certainly, she hasn't moved the dial of independence. However... Given the fact that independence is now at a much higher level than, say, it was you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, you'd be starting from, the next leader would be starting from a high base. You know, when I called that independence referendum with David Cameron back in 2012, independence was at 30 per cent. So despite the recent poll setbacks, uh, you know, we're talking about a 50-50 situation, basically, Mike, and that's not a bad place to start from if you're going to conduct a a referendum, an independence campaign. The other thing you'd have to say is, you know, the opportunities over the last few years, I mean, uh, have been manifest. I mean, you know, Britain has run like a failed state at the present moment. I mean, <laughs> the, the prime ministers uh, you're up against uh, haven't been up to much, uh, are not up to much. Uh, so that was kind of a big opportunity to make the case. However, you know, a new leader comes in, you it can be a reinvigoration of a party, a leadership contest. It can be a disaster, of course, like the Tory one last year, but it could be a reinvigoration. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's worth thinking about, isn't it? Because there were those in the Tory party who thought, you know, let's have a new beginning. Let's get a fresh start. Let's get this trust in. Uh, let's get rid of Boris Johnson. <laughs> and then look what happened. You know, so here we are. I mean, I was thinking this morning as I was coming into work, knowing I was going to be talking to you, I'm thinking to myself, you know, potentially this could be a real disaster for the SNP as an entity because, you know, she's made it so much about her in recent times. Um, and I'm not, you know, here to sort of dance in a grave or anything like that, but, but she has made it such a cult of personality that without her and her as leader and sitting on the back benches, I mean, what's the SNP for? I'm not sure that anyone in Britain could name a single member uh, of the Scottish Parliament SNP team, uh, or indeed even the London one now. 
Well, I can. <laughs> well, I know you can because I mean, you're, you, you should be able to. I mean, I would expect you to be able to do that. But I don't think anybody's ever heard, for example, uh, of Stephen Flynn. I heard him interviewed this morning. And he didn't seem to have a clue what to say or what to do. He didn't know who was going to be the leader. He didn't know what their policy was going to be uh, on transgender rights. He didn't know what their policy was going to be uh, on the new bill that this went through. He didn't seem to know what their policy was going to be on independence. Yeah, but I mean, look, uh, you know, Stephen uh, Flynn's a, a relative newcomer uh, and he'll, uh, he'll soon get uh, used to handling and bamboozling questions from the likes of you, Mike. <laughs> and, and it's not really fair to to ask the, the newly elected Westminster leader, you know, firstly, who the next leader's going to be, is going to have to make that backing very careful choice, or what they're going to do about issues like transgender. I mean, one of the puzzling things, Mike, is over just the last few weeks, the number of own goals, unforced errors, like the transgender debate, but that's not a difficult... I mean, it's a difficult, sensitive issue that requires sensitive handling. But, you know, it's easy enough to, to, to square the issue, to find a compromise, to, to accept some of the amendments that were made by the SNP backbenchers, to take the sting and heat out of the issue. The, the big things that the, the SNP government have to face are the problems in health and education. And, and stop, you know, having unforced errors like not dueling the A9 or this ridiculous bottle scheme. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean... I mean, the idea that, that, that they've even... That's one of their achievements, allegedly, which has gone horribly wrong, is a bottle deposit scheme. I mean, is that well, really... Coming, is that, I mean, is that really what Scotland needs? I mean, for heaven's sake, I'm looking at some graphs in the Telegraph this morning. Drug-related deaths under Nicola Sturgeon have soared. Life expectancy is getting shorter. Poor children are not catching up uh, with better-off kids. Um, and government deficit lags other nations. I mean, you know, there is nothing good there. And yeah. it seems to me that this whole transgender issue was cooked up because of um, Patrick Harvey and the Green Party, because of this kind of, you know, obsession that Nicola, for some reason, has got about it, and she didn't need to even do it. You know, if she hadn't touched the issue at all, what difference would that have made? Well, I mean, to be fair, if you're a, a Scottish nationalist, you don't really want the Daily Telegraph writing your report card, Mike. It might be not totally <laughs> Listen, unbiased. we had Alan Cochrane on yesterday. Now he's back on the front page. He's made his return. Oh, well, Alan... Alan, Alan will be loving it. I mean, you <laughs> might not dance in Nicholas grave, but Alan will be dancing away with the island thing. But, but you do make a, a serious point, uh, and that is if you look at the, the, the difficulties, disasters, recent of, of the SNP government, they, they've all got a green source behind them. You know, the Greens have gone into government. They don't like roads or building roads. The A9 promise is reneged upon, which is huge in the Highlands, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, and certainly should be now re-established uh, re as quickly as possible. The Gender Recognition Act, the failure to accept very reasonable amendments, can only be explained by green pressure. This bottle return scheme is under the control of a... Well, I'm, the control's the wrong word. It's out of control under the Green, uh, the green Minister. You know, it, it does seem that the green tail has been wagging the SNP dog, yeah. much to the detriment of the government and the, uh, and the position of... Uh, of the SNP, but also, and what really interests me as leader of the Alpha Party, the position of Scottish independence. So what we're hoping for is somebody emerges out of the pack, and that might happen in a leadership contest, it's happened before. That person will see the opportunity to reunite the, the national movement, to, to bring in all the people who've been excluded by Nicola Sturgeon. I'm not talking here just about political parties, but I'm talking about the cross-party groups, the non-party groups, the people who were so prominent during the referendum campaign and did so well, uh, and reinvigorate the movement on that basis. Also, try and separate the business and government, which is always difficult, Mike. All governments, even competent ones, have difficulties. You have to separate that from the pursuit of independence. So, so you, when the government runs into bumps in the road, you don't damage the independence yeah, campaign. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think you've made that point very, very eloquently because of what seemingly Nicola Sturgeon lost sight of is what the SNP is for. And the SNP is supposedly in government, having unseated, you know, the, uh, the Labour Party, which was the ruling party of Scotland, an incredible achievement in a way that the Labour Party has been more or less ousted out of what was one of its absolute strongholds in Britain, right? They then get government. They then want to achieve devolution. They get devolution. They get the powers they want. They then push forward for independence. And then they forget about all that. And they start messing about with bottles and transgender rights and all the rest of it. And what you've just described to me, Alex Salmond, is your 
job application for leading the movement because you're the only guy up there that can do it. Yeah, but well, that's a slight drawback. I'm not a member of the Scottish National Party. No, but you don't Party. have to be. You've just described the movement of independence. It's not the Scottish National Party anymore. It's independence, pure and simple. Well, it's certainly true that if you... The, the idea of reuniting the movement is through the vehicle of a, an independence convention, which will bring all the groups together. That's an idea that Nicola herself supported once, but you know, not more recently. So that would be the way to do it. You, you know, it would be that, that through that proposal. But it's, it's urgently needed. Now... What would you be doing? What would that independence convention be doing? Well, two things I can suggest. One, you would focus the independence campaign on issues that are going to be telling and persuading people. Like, for example, we've got a million Scots who can't afford their heating bills in a, an energy-rich country, in a country which has got energy sources coming out of their ears. Uh, folk can't afford to turn on their heating. That's what matters to people. Uh, and also the, the pursuit of self-determination. Scotland's a nation that has a right of self-determination. That right's being denied. That's what's going to get the, the, the backs of people in Scotland up. That's going to, what's going to get the, the hell of burning or at least smouldering in Scotland uh, when, you, when you argue that campaign and not get it stuck in the, the long grass of this problem, that problem, and, and that series of unforced errors. So you know, the opportunity is there. Remember, the SFB... And this is the difference between a generation ago. It's the most powerful party in Scotland. The national movement is the most powerful political force in Scotland. You know, this this game is not over. This no. game is uh, they have to be played. Well, it one could well. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's. A, I'll, I'll come back to you to make one more point. But you know, yes, the game is afoot, and maybe the game has only just begun because at the end of the day, without a decent leader, the SNP is not a very united party. Let's face it. There are people talking about the possibility of a young woman who's currently Chancellor um, who could become the leader. But, you know, she would be, I would have thought, completely opposed to certainly the Transgender Act. She's, she's a, a, from, a, from a small independent church. She's got very conservative views. There are many people in the SNP that you know who are left-wing of Jeremy Corbyn. Well, the, the Free Kirk of Scotland wouldn't be mine being called independent because uh, that's one of its... Uh, key aspects, but uh, it probably was ever been called small. I mean, it's a fairly substantial denomination. But listen, you know, I, I don't take this stuff about, you know, somebody of a, a faith cannot be real in Scotland. All you have to do from that perspective is to say these issues are matters of conscience. So as long as you don't try to dictate other people's conscience, as, they, as you would expect them not to dictate yours, mm. then a whole range of difficult challenging issues quite legitimately can be placed as matters of conscience not when you try to to put people through party discipline eh, as they did in the gen and the gender recognition bill so i mean that, that, you know, that doesn't disqualify somebody from from leadership and you know there are other uh, younger uh, candidates ash reagan neil gray for example now, I, I don't know if, if if any of these people are up to the uh, leading the national movement forward. But one interesting thing happens during a leadership campaign is you, you tend to find out. And it wouldn't be the first time in politics that a relatively unknown figure has emerged to be a be a significant figure. I, I was rather amused for about, about, you know, I saw one of the Labour commentators saying that Nicola Sturgeon's resignation has handed Sir Keir Starmer the keys of number 10 Downing Street. If you rely on somebody else to give you the keys of 10 Downing Street, you'll never get them. No. The you people who win elections are the people who do it for themselves. Uh, you know, Sir Keir Starmer's dull as ditch water. I mean, you talk about inspiring people. Well, I mean, poor old Sir Keir Starmer. Poor old Sir Keir Starmer once again blunders his way into a press conference. Um, by the time he'd finished his press conference and people were starting to write the story up, Nicola Sturgeon resigned. So he's not even made the papers today, unfortunately for him. But one final question I'm going to ask you one more time. If you were asked to unite the independence movement in whatever role, would you do it? Oh, I, if I was asked to contribute, I mean, look, I spent a lifetime fighting for this cause. I'll continue to fight for this cause. I'll do it in whatever uh, role that's, uh, that's available to do it. And I'll do it positively and trying to keep people on the vision, which I think is, uh, is so important for the, the Scottish nation, and that's to be self-governing and to take the responsibilities that come with it. That, that, that is the way forward for Scotland. And, and, you know, we'll get the occasional highway and byway on the way. But I suspect we'll get there in the end, mate. Well, listen, Alex, I suspect we're going to be talking to you quite a lot over the next few weeks and months, so uh, stay where you are. Don't go anywhere. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Alex Salmond, uh, former First Minister of Scotland. Uh, could he be the man that actually takes over? You never know. You know, stranger things have happened.